Mark chapter 6, verses 1 to 6. A prophet without honor. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked? What's this wisdom that he has been given, that, even, that he even does miracles? Is this, isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, Only in his hometown, among his relatives, and his own, in his own house as a prophet without honor. He could not do any miracles there, except lay hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. Continuing to read in Mark chapter 6, we're going to look at verses 14 to 29, which is on page, still 1008 in church Bibles. John the Baptist beheaded. King Herod heard about this, for Jesus' name had become well known. Some were saying, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. And that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Others said he is Elijah. And still others claimed he is a prophet, like one of the prophets of long ago. But when Herod heard this, he said, John, the man I beheaded, has been raised from the dead. For Herod himself had given orders to have John arrested. And he had him bound and put in prison. He did this because of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, whom he had married. For John had been saying to Herod, This is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. So Herodias nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him, but she was not able to, because Herod feared John and protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. When Herod heard John, he was greatly puzzled, yet he liked to listen to him. Finally, the opportune time came. On his birthday, Herod gave a banquet for his high officials and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. When the daughter of Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. The king said to the girl, ask me for anything you want and I'll give it to you. And he promised her with an oath, whatever you ask, I will give you up to half my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what shall I ask for? The head of John the Baptist, she answered. At once the girl hurried into the king with the request, I want you to give me right now the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was greatly distressed, but because of his oath and his dinner guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. The man went, beheaded John in the prison, and brought back his head on a platter. He presented it to the girl, and she gave it to her mother. On hearing of this, John's disciples came, took his body, and led it in a tomb. And then turning over to Mark chapter 8, looking at verses 27 to 38. Peter's confession of Christ. Jesus and his disciples went to the villages around Caesarea Philippi. On the way, he asked them, Who do people say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, you are the Christ. Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. Jesus predicts his death. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, yet forfeit his soul? 
Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Since the start of the year, we've been looking at the Gospel of Mark, which begins with that amazing statement, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And we've seen those three elements as the weeks have gone on. The message which Mark has written down for us to read today is good news. There's short supply of good news in the world today. Well, now the new good news has come. It is here. It has arrived. And then the second thing from that is that the good news is found in Jesus. You can look in all sorts of different places in the world, but it's only in him that good news can be found. And it is found in Jesus, who is the Christ. And this Christ is the Son of God. He is the one who is uniquely placed to bring the blessing of God, the good news from God. So in this opening affirmation, our hearts can be encouraged. The one true living God, the God known as Father, who has affirmed his Son, the God countless people have come to acknowledge for themselves as King, as the Anointed One, this good news is found in Jesus. And so immediately now we come to the passage which we have in front of us, 2 Mark chapter 6, 1 and 2, where we read that Jesus left the place where he had raised Jack Jairus' 12-year-old daughter from the dead and went to his hometown, Nazareth, accompanied by his disciples. And when the Sabbath came, he was teaching in the synagogue. And many who heard him were amazed. They were amazed at the good news because Jesus has come as the bringer of good news. They were amazed at his teaching. This was good news being experienced firsthand. Have you ever had the delight of hearing a passage of the Bible being read in church? And as it's being read, you think, what is that all about? And then it is explained, it is unpacked. And as it is applied, you say, so that's what it's about. It's so clear. Why hadn't I seen it before? Well, perhaps it was something very similar to that that the people experienced in Nazareth that Shabbat morning. As Jesus preached simply, graciously, powerfully, the people recognized in his voice a tone of authority, and there was an authenticity about what he said. They were amazed. We see that in verse, 30, verse 3. They were amazed at his teaching. They were amazed when they considered where he had got his wisdom from. Because they said in verse 3, isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son, the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? Uh, wouldn't you like to know what their names were as well? And they took offense at him. Amazement quickly turned to offense. Have you ever wondered, by the way, how we know that Jesus is a carpenter? Well, this is where we're given that information. Jesus, the carpenter. And you can see what was going on in the local people's minds. Jesus, he is a working man. He's just like us. He's somebody with big, rough hands, used to manual labor. And now he's preaching. It's not right. It's not the way it's meant to be. They took offense at him. Interesting, isn't it? And Jesus in verse 4 said to them, Only in his own time, among his relatives and in his own house, is a prophet without honor. It was as if they couldn't get past the memories of him playing in the street, growing up, working in his dad's workshop. They took offense at him. And when they did, they precluded themselves from the blessing that Jesus wanted to lavish upon them. Do you see what it says in verse 5? I wonder if you noticed it when Colin read it to us. In verse 5 it says, Jesus 
could not do any miracles there except to lay hands on a few sick people and heal them. Is that not deeply shocking? So offended were they by what Jesus had got to say that Jesus could not do any miracle there. The atmosphere was so deeply negative within His home environment that the blessing that Jesus wanted to give was totally and utterly crushed. Now, the implication for us has to be clear. It's stark. Jesus wants to bless. Jesus wants to grant the blessings of the Word of life. He wants His words to impact our hearts, our homes, our congregation, our places of work. But where there is unbelief, where there is negativity, the blessing Jesus wants to pour out in totality is utterly negated. It cannot happen. I wonder if I can earth this. Parents, and here I'm speaking to myself. Parents, do we go out of our way to bless our children rather than crush them? When they come out with a good idea, do we see how we can encourage that, how we can make it come about, or do we immediately fall into a well-worn pattern of negativity and poke holes in whatever it is that they suggest to show how it couldn't possibly happen? Well, if that's the case, we need to repent of that and let the gospel reshape, reorientate our minds. Or teenagers, could you, I wonder, wake up in the morning and think of ways of proactively helping in the home without being badgered to do so by frustrated parents? That's a way of turning negativity into good news. Or people at work. Is it possible, I wonder, for us to think proactively how among our colleagues or our staff we could thank, we could encourage, we could bless, rather than wait until they've done something wrong and then send them a stinging email? Or here at church, in what ways could we deliberately, conscientiously go out of our way to create a culture of faith? rather than a culture of negativity, a community where it is possible to do things rather than think of reasons why it's impossible, a place where we thank people rather than criticize them, where we think how we may bless rather than tear down, a context in which we can look how to give rather than take away, an environment where we can pour out love rather than finding fault. Because unless that becomes our natural and normal pattern, the warning from Mark chapter 6 is utterly plain. There is such a jaundiced view of Jesus and His Word that He is unable to do any miracles among them. Where Christ is welcomed where He is embraced, where He is honored, where His grace is received and applied, there is no limit to what Jesus can do within the community among His people. Initially, the people were amazed, and then they were offended, and ultimately they rejected the messenger that God had sent. Three stages. Now, that then brings us to the second story which Colin read to us from Mark chapter 6, and it pertains to John the Baptist. In chapter 6, verse 14, we're told that King Herod heard about Jesus' ministry of preaching, healing, and deliverance, and something deeply stirred within the depths of his being because it reminded him of something that had happened to him some time before. Chapter 6, verse 12 tells us, that the disciples sent out by Jesus were calling people to repent. Now, that certainly brought something to Herod's mind. It was an incident that had taken place in his own experience, and it obviously unsettled him. Mark chapter 1 tells us that in order to prepare the way for the coming king, John had been baptizing in the desert region. And in chapter 1, verse 4, we are told that he preached a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. 
Now, what is repentance? Well, it is a recognition that something is currently bad, but there is a need to turn away from what is wrong and start going in a direction that is right. Repentance is a determination to stop going down the wrong way and start going the right way. But how does somebody know what they are doing is wrong unless someone tells them? And John had such a ministry. It was a prophetic role. Using the Scriptures just as Jonah and Amos and Jeremiah had done before, John as a prophet pointed out to the people their sins and the implications of those sins and called them to say sorry, to change their behavior. And this is something John did with neither fear nor favor, because it is plain that he came to no less a figure than Herod the king himself, and said in chapter 6, verse 18, it is not lawful for you to be married to your brother's wife. Herod was about to commit adultery. Repent, King Herod. Don't do it. And the interesting thing about the story in verse 20 is that although John puzzled him, yet amazingly enough, Herod was kind of intrigued by him. The verse says he liked to listen to him. Herod was amazed by John. He was amazed at his courage. He was amazed at what he had to say. He was amazed at his righteousness. Do you see that in verse 20? Herod feared John. He protected him, knowing him to be a righteous and holy man. But amazed though Herod was by John, his wife Herodias, in verse 19, nursed a grudge against him. In other words, she was deeply offended by him. Now, let me try to explain why. Do you see what Herod's wife's name was? It was Herodias. Now, that gives us a little bit of a clue as to what the problem was. Herodias, you see, belonged to the same family as Herod. She was, in fact, his niece. And the Bible in the book of Leviticus makes perfectly plain that marriage is prohibited between, for example, an aunt to her nephew or an uncle to his niece. And so, while nobody else in the king's court had the courage to say anything to Herod, John the Baptist had done it. He had said it face to face. Do you see that? If you marry Herodias, it would be incestuous, adulterous and incestuous. Repent, King Herod. Return to living according to the law of God instead of flaunting it. Can you see how upfront John had been with the king in verse 18? It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. This was not something that he spoke of privately behind Herod's back. It was something he had courage to say face to face. But when she heard about this, Herod's wife in verse 19 was furious with this godly, unsettling man. And we're told she nursed a grudge against John and wanted to kill him. It's perhaps wrong to generalize, but how often it is that women hold grudges. But whether it is a woman or whether it is a man who does so, it is utterly sinful. So sinful, in fact, verse 24, that when the opportunity came for this calculating woman to get what she wanted, she asked for nothing less than the head of John the Baptist on a platter. What a wretched request. What started out for Herod with amazement quickly turned to offense, and that ultimately led to rejection, rejection of the messenger of God. This holy, righteous man was executed, brutally beheaded, much as we've seen in Al-Qaeda propaganda films, because of the grudge which Herodias held against John, John Christ's forerunner. It's impossible to stress too strongly the destructive power of holding a grudge. Grudges are sinful. 
Grudges are evil. Grudges destroy. And frighteningly, please note how they have the ability not only to destroy the one against whom the grudge is held, but ultimately they also destroy the one who holds it. And in this particular case, outside the uh, Scriptures, we know from uh, elsewhere in the, in the writings of the day that, that uh, before long after John was executed, um, having also stepped over the mark in a matter with the Roman Emperor Caligula, Herod and Herodias were summoned to Rome, and there they were dismissed from office. They were sent off uh, to Spain, banished there, where in fact they died, and Herod was actually replaced by Herodias' brother Agrippa. Um, what an irony. But do you see the sequence of events? Just like the first story we were looking at in the early part of chapter 6, amazement leading to offense and ultimately rejection. Well, it's such a stark warning, isn't it, for any of us like Herod or Herodias, steadfastly refused to repent of immorality or grudges. The consequences are so severe that we are called to repent, reorientate our minds, center our whole hearts on the life of God. And then thirdly and lastly, look, if you will, at the final story which Colin read to us today from chapter 8, 27 through to 38. Here Jesus and His disciples, they had been traveling around the region. They had been feeding the hungry. They had been exercising authority over the elements, healing the sick, preaching the good news, the gospel, because Jesus is the big, big bringer of good news. Everywhere Jesus went, there was bad news, but He brought good news to the situation because this is the gospel, the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Jesus is the good news. But having spent a good while with the disciples, he now decided it was time to ask a deep and searching question. You can see it in chapter 8, verse 27. Who do people say that I am? In other words, now that we've been doing this work for a period of time, what's the chat out there? When they replied in verse 28, some say that you are John the Baptist. Funny enough, we've just been talking about him. It wasn't just Herod who feared that John had come back to haunt him, but the ordinary people also seemed to have it caught on to that continuity of message. Just as John had been preaching a message of repentance, so the disciples of Jesus were doing the same. They had been calling the people to repent, to change, to reorientate. But others thought that perhaps Jesus was Elijah. In the Old Testament book of Malachi, for example, in chapter 4, God had promised that before the great and terrible day, the day of the Lord, there would come the prophet Elijah. Is that who Jesus was, they wondered? Well, of course it wasn't, because that reference to Elijah was, in fact, a reference to John the Baptist. But you see, this was the general chit-chat. This is what the tabloid newspapers were suggesting. And so, having established that, Jesus then turned to His disciples and said, okay, what about you? Who do you say that I am? They have heard the general message. This is their general sort of idea, but, but specifically, you know me. Who do you say that I am? And Peter, apparently speaking for the whole of the disciple band, uh, responded that in their opinion, Jesus wasn't just an ordinary prophet. He wasn't even the final prophet. In their opinion, they had come to the decision that He was, in fact, the Christ. That is, He was the affirmed, identified one as the beloved Son of the living Lord. And at this point, verse 31 tells us that Jesus then went on and began to teach them what kind of Messiah He would be. This Son of Man 
must suffer many things. He must be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law. He must be killed and after three days rise again. But at this we are told that Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. The word here is to chastise him. You're wrong, Jesus. Amazement at Jesus turned to offense at Jesus. No, Jesus. You've made a huge and tragic mistake. That is not what the Jewish Messiah will be like. Our Messiah will will be the one who will crush the Roman occupying force. The Jewish Messiah will be the one who will liberate Israel for its own political independence. Don't miss the location, by the way, where all this happened. Verse 27, it was Caesarea Philippi. It was in the city built by the Romans for the worship of Augustus the king. The kind of Messiah we are looking forward to is the one who would crush this Roman occupying force. And Jesus said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You have not the mind of God. You have the mind of man. The worldly way you're talking about is the superficial nationalistic way. The worldly way is the way of brute force and ignorance. The worldly way is the way of might and of power, but the gospel way, the good news way, is the way of the cross. It is the way of denial, of humility, of suffering, of death. But you see, this is why Jesus came to earth, to demonstrate the gospel way is the countercultural way to everything that this world holds dear and vital and important, because the gospel way, verse 35, is the way of salvation. It is the way of resurrection. It is the route to glory. It is the way to eternal life. In this third and final story, Peter was initially amazed at Jesus, and then he was offended by Jesus, and ultimately Jesus was rejected by one of the twelve. But you see, the way that Jesus unfolds for us in the gospel is the way He calls His followers to follow too. The gospel way. I wonder as we are unpacking the Word of God this morning, what's the reaction? Amazed? So that's what it means. I, I never realized that before. Offended? Hmm. The Bible implying that I need to repent. Imagine implying that I am behaving in an ungodly manner that needs to be turned away from. Rejected. But if we reject the way of teaching of Jesus, then please also face up to the consequences of such negativity, of unbelief, of grudges, for it is the way to hell. But the gospel, the good news, when we make it true for ourselves and for us as a congregation, it is the way to life, it is the way to renewed relationship, it is the way to lavish blessings. Christ the Savior, the glorious Son of God. We'll pray together.
Our Heavenly Father, You give us such a stark alternative. And so, as we hear Your Word, will You give to us such a divine dissatisfaction until it changes the way we behave? But may we not merely determine to put off bad behavior, but to replace it by centering our entire being on Jesus. And what we ask is for His glory. Amen. Let's continue to respond to God as we bring to Him our morning offering. On the mountain, the Lord gave his people these words. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Let us pray. In your mercy and grace, O Lord, receive these offerings of our money and the offerings of our prayers. In recent days, Sins of the secret place and of the night have been proclaimed from the housetops. 
They have assaulted our eyes and ears. They have filled us with horror at their depravity and with shame since they were committed within a church fellowship. This morning, we pray for those who find themselves amid the mess and the debris. For those who have been deceived and betrayed, deprived of their dearest mother or father, their brother or sister. Now the pain of their loss, having mellowed over 20 years, it has returned in a new and a shocking form. Lord Jesus, bring healing to deeply wounded hearts. Bring light to minds in darkness and confusion. Bring love to lives which have known shame and hypocrisy and lies. We pray for those who minister to them and to others in similar circumstances. For those who minister to them both within and without the church. And we pray for those who shall spend many years in prison for their evil deeds. Lord, talk of remorse and repentance and forgiveness can be cheap and just that talk and so we pray for a work of your spirit even in their hearts that they may truly return to the Savior And may all who would trifle with the basic standards of Christian morality, may all such be given the strength to resist the seductive lies and allurements of the evil one. And may we all, who think that we stand, take heed lest we fall. This week we also heard of a murder not within the Christian community but upon it in Pakistan where a Christian cabinet minister was assassinated for his faith. We thank you for his courage in the face of death. We pray for his family and for all Christians in that country, including members of our sister church, the Presbyterian Church of Pakistan. We pray for Ron and Hilary McCartney and others who are working there. And we pray for those in other places who face similar threats and dangers. Grant, O Lord, to your people strength and courage and to your foes confusion and frustration. Nearer home, we respond to Chris Simon's request for prayer. We mention his needs for suitable accommodation and for greater support for the work you've given him. And we bring our own personal concerns, anxieties, fears, hopes. Yea, and as you have reminded us this morning, grudges and familiarity.
We pray all these things in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. <laughs>